Hey, Cypher here. As many of you may know from my Newsies review, I'm a sucker for musicals. Put a bunch of singing and dancing behind it, and I'll probably give it more of a pass than I would historical fiction. But The Greatest Showman is just weird. I can't hate it like some critics who appallingly misrepresent the problems of this film, but even my musical-loving self can't completely ignore them. P.T. Barnum simply does not yield the story we got here. Which is too bad, because the old huckster deserves a good adaptation. P.T. Barnum's early life is somewhat shrouded in mystery. While we have his accounts of the time, he was a well-known liar. The first time he graced the pages of a newspaper, he was showing off a slave woman he had bought in 1835 named Joyce Heth in New York. She was so old-looking that he told everyone she was George Washington's nurse, who had died 36 years prior. With his extravagant claims of her age, sometimes as much as 161, he was able to sell a lot of tickets. When she died a few months later, he sold tickets to her autopsy. This started his career, but he came to regret it, saying the farce was the least deserving of all my efforts in the show line. From such an ignominious beginning, Barnum rose quickly. He gathered a troupe of performers and traveled up and down the eastern seaboard. Though the bank crash of 1837 stopped him a little bit, he managed to scam enough money to purchase the Scudder's American Museum in New York four years later. He set it up to be a museum of curiosities, including real people. He often made them out to be something they really weren't. It was all a show not to be trusted. As Barnum said, Now and then someone would cry out, Humbug! And charlatan! But so much the better for me! It helped to advertise me, and I was willing to bear the reputation. And I engaged queer curiosities, and even monstrosities, simply to add to the notoriety of the museum. Notoriety certainly came. He was a prominent fixture of the city. It was a lot of silly fun to most folks, and he got rich. In 1852, he began politicking by calling for temperance, as in the personal prohibition of alcohol. Of course, he couldn't help but charge for it. One newspaper said, the great Barnum, having exhausted all the wonders of the world, is now reduced to the necessity of exhibiting himself in Connecticut as a teetotaler, and Democrat died in the wool. He became an abolitionist and often spoke out about it, while remaining a Democrat whose party was explicitly pro-slavery. He declared, If I thought there was a drop of blood in me that was not Democratic, I would let it out if I had to cut the jugular vein. When, however, secession threatened in 1860, I thought it was time for a new departure, and I identified myself with the Republican Party. This would prove to be somewhat of his undoing. He was definitely an abolitionist by 1862. He was so pro-Union that his museum was targeted by irregular Confederates toward the end of the war. The building burnt to the ground causing a massive fire to spread across the city. Much of the nearby area was in ruins, and the museum was at its epicenter. Just a few months prior, a coordinated arson campaign administered by Robert Kennedy, not that one, had taken buildings nearby, so it was probably just another Confederate sympathizer. A few months later, Barnum opened another museum. This too burnt to the ground in 1868. He had a problem with fires. Heck, his mansion burnt down a couple of times. Hilariously, one of these might have been caused by him because he would set off rockets to ward off burglars. So that might be one of the causes. Either way, he had become a bit distant from the whole enterprise. So instead, he went and got elected at the Connecticut House of Representatives in 1865. He remained there until 1869. Now he did not sit idly by while he was there. As he said in his speech, I have come to this legislature simply because I wished to have the honor of voting for the two constitutional amendments. One for driving slavery entirely out of our country, the other to allow men of education and good moral character to vote, regardless of the color of their skins. During this time, he ran for Congress, but he ended up losing in a funny way. His cousin won the seat instead, who went on to be the longest running chair of the Democratic National Committee afterward. Weird. Once P.T. Barnum was done with all that political stuff in 1869, he began a circus. It was basically a traveling version of his museum, but with a lot more staged performances. He even found time to become mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut for a year. 
He did well for a decade, but eventually merged with another circus ran by James Anthony Bailey in 1881. Barnum continued on for another decade before he died in 1891. The circus continued after his death and after Bailey died as well, which caused the Ringling Brothers to buy Barnum and Bailey in 1907. More than a century later, the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus was still going on, long enough for me to have gone a couple of times. Unfortunately, its attendance died out, and they stopped in 2017, just in time for this movie's release. Obviously, The Greatest Showman was not created to take advantage of the closure. Though I will admit to a wave of nostalgia when I watched it. It was announced in 2011, long before closure was announced. Either way, they clearly had potential for a good story here. You probably noticed that I used a lot of primary sources during the reality section. That's because there is just so much out there. P.T. Barnum himself wrote two autobiographies, and plenty of other material. Interestingly enough, he also had a side thing about debunking hoaxes, and wrote a great deal about that. Imagine P.T. Barnum going and debunking hoaxes. Spiritualism was on the rise in the postbellum period, so he was basically pulling a Houdini half a century before Houdini. So there's a lot of material from Barnum alone. Of course, he was a self-admitted con artist, so you have to be wary of using just his testimony, more so than you normally would. Some people seem to think one primary source is good enough, but it is best to attack these things from multiple angles if you can, and there is plenty to do so. Barnum was a public figure, and an enigmatic one at that. It was in his interest to drum up the press, and he certainly did. Luckily, the New York Herald and the New York Post both are archived on Chronicling America for the period in question. All you have to do is specify the date and put in the keyword Barnum. Chronicling America has gotten a lot better than it was a few years ago, and I use it all the time now to find primary sources. And you can get really deep in this stuff, if you'd like. I ended up reading over 50 articles for this because the movie made me. But first, let's at least try to praise it. Generally, this film understands Barnum's demeanor. I'm guessing they read one of his autobiographies. The way he recruits folks to turn the old Scudder Museum into an attraction is spot on. How he handled his detractors was almost identical to the film. Reprint this review in every paper in New York. Half price tickets to anyone who brings it in. So some of the general feeling can be said to be accurate to the true story. But I've seen more than a few critics outraged that the movie could show Barnum in a good light. That's like doing a movie where chickens keep singing about how grateful they are for Colonel Sanders. Uh, Hugh, Mr. Jackman, please don't make that movie. To these people, I say, you have no idea what you are talking about and should leave such criticism to people who are intelligent enough to back up what they are saying in evidence. It is the height of hubris for these critics to be campaigning on behalf of historical accuracy while having no basis for their complaints. It is a sad state of affairs when movie critics defend history under the pretense of their own delusions. What's even more atrocious is these same critics will hypocritically defend a film they like from accusations of inaccuracy. I don't know why I pay attention when it comes to history films, and I guess I shouldn't, since they haven't a clue. Barnum was certainly a liar, cheat, and con artist. Hyperbole isn't the worst crime. Men suffer more from imagining too little than too much. The creed of a true fraud. But the way these critics speak of him imply that he was some demon out to exploit his curiosities to their detriment. They also try to say he didn't have liberal leanings, which is flat out false, revealing how little these people understand the topic they want to speak about. But you gave us a real family. And the circus. That was our home. And we will You can complain about exploitation all you want, but do not say you are defending accuracy, because no one complained of exploitation, and you do not get to speak on the behalf of the dead without having done them the courtesy of reading them. Otherwise, you are exploiting them worse than you say they are allegedly exploited by Barnum. What's even more unfortunate is that this film is deeply inaccurate, but not in the way these hypocritical critics have told us.
The film has hardly any basis in reality. It obviously has to compress time, but then why does it add things and completely ignore others? Two characters in this form a whole subplot about miscegenation. Have you no shame? Associating yourself with that Barnum business is one thing. But parading around with the help. They are not real people, and I don't know why this is in here. Seriously, why does Barnum need a sidekick, especially as a business partner? What I have is an overcompensated apprentice. For a man who was famously stingy, why would he ever hire some businessman? And finally, why does the story need this whole subplot where the sidekick falls in love with a black woman and gets in trouble for miscegenation? What's the point? Of all the things they could have done with Barnum's story, this is pretty bad, but it gets even worse. The main storyline is fraught with weird changes for no apparent reason. All of the recruits for his museum are false. Especially egregious is how Tom Thumb was brought in. In reality, Charles Stratton, which was his real name, was a distant cousin of Barnum's. Stratton was brought into the show at the age of five. He grew up in Barnum's museum and was one of its most popular attractions. Yes, Barnum consistently lied about how old the kid was to audiences, but he knew the reality behind his humbuggery. Then there's Jenny Lind, who was known as the Swedish Nightingale. She has this whole love affair with Barnum while they're on tour in the film, which is injuriously false. The real Lind was fed up with Barnum, and that's why she quit. She was doing the tour for charity, sending all the money she made away, and she thought that he was promoting her too much. They even show newspapers getting into the adulterous gossip, with pictures and everything. I'll get into the news side of this film soon enough, but the production of this film couldn't even bother to log into Chronicling America, apparently, and that definitely was not printed. No, instead, they used the false story to drive a rift between Barnum and his wife. Oh, nothing happened. It's on the cover of every paper in New York. Because she Charity Hallett Barnum never left PT in their entire 30-year marriage. Their entire romance is falsified here. While he was poor, Charity, or Cherry as he called her, was poor as well. She was making a living as a seamstress at the time of Barnum's proposal. Finally, the worst part of all of this was the depiction of the press and protests. It's certainly possible there were protests of Barnum's museum, but they went unrecorded. And they make the protesters seem like they're the reason that P.T. Barnum's museum got burnt down. In fact, the movie actually makes no mention of Barnum's politics or the Civil War in general, despite Barnum having a deep part in abolitionism. But the production couldn't know that because they obviously never consulted a newspaper. With a budget of $84 million, you'd think they were capable of having an intern log in to Chronicling America. This really shows when they quote articles in the film that verifiably don't exist. One of the main antagonists in the film is James Gordon Bennett, who ran the New York Herald. I went through dozens of articles in the Herald, trying to find any negative press on Barnum. The closest it gets is calling out Barnum for his humbuggery, but otherwise it's all pretty positive. Barnum did write in his autobiography about Bennett having a property dispute with him, and that resulting in some bad press, but nothing directly about Barnum himself. In fact, Barnum's main complaint was that Bennett removed his ads from the Herald. So I don't get where this movie is getting this whole idea. People were probably annoyed and angered by the freak show, but it never made it into the papers. The culmination of the film is predicated on this falsehood. I can easily forgive not showing the second museum in fire, or even Barnum's political career, but don't mislead the audience into thinking the museum itself was controversial enough to be a victim of arson. Heck, the Herald was almost destroyed by the inferno of Barnum's museum, so you'd think that would make it into the movie at least. There's an excellent article in the Herald about the fire, which took the entire front page. Honestly, I don't know what they were thinking in making this film. Its plot is all over the place with nonsensical fictionalization and falsification. It was in development since 2011 and clearly had too many hands on it to remain coherent and an enigmatic. Try saying that five times fast. And an an enig- and an enigmatic what? And an enigmatic- ugh.